<laughs> Let's look at the prophetic for a minute. Jesus said, well, you're right about that. You, you, you are definitely right about that because um, you have had five. <laughs> and the one that you now have, <laughs> he ain't your husband. So you did speak the truth when you said that. Jesus said, you've had five husbands. And the, the husband that you currently have, he ain't your husband. So you've had five. The one you're currently with, he's not yours, but he makes six. So you've had five husbands. Now, here's something that's interesting. And I'm not saying that this is deep revelation. I just think it's interesting. When you think about this woman and this system of worship that she's under, and Jesus begins to speak prophetically, he says, you've had five Husbands. Now, what's interesting is what Jesus gave his people were apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We call it the fivefold ministry. So, what Jesus gave to cover, if we want to use that word, to nourish, to feed, to guide, and to protect. This is what the faith of God has always done. God's leadership has always been in the body to feed and to lead, to guide and protect. But this woman of Samaria has been in all of these adulterous relationships with people trying to get out of this religious system and its leaders nourishment and food and sustenance you've had five husbands because this system that you are involved in it also has a false representation of true ministry see this is what we need to understand that this false system just like back with ahab and jezebel those false systems have a false representation of what true ministry does and this woman has been trying to find this nourishment in all of these adulterous illicit relationships that did not supply did not provide she had five and then the one that she now had this woman is on her sixth man Glory to God. Listen now. Listen, listen. Hey, Pastor Rob. Listen, listen. This woman is on her sixth man. But and even the sixth man can't meet and supply the need, the deeper longing of her heart. This sixth man that she's now involved with. Now, what's interesting is the scripture tells us that on the sixth day, God created man on the sixth day. See, nothing that is of the natural order can actually meet the human need. So, you know, just religious systems themselves and natural religious systems and philosophies and I don't, you know, and, and ideologies, none of that, no matter how spiritual it sounds, can actually meet the longing of the human heart because there is a part of you that can only be filled by God. Now, y'all stay with me for a minute. Y'all stay with me. This is the sixth man she's with. See, so she's still living under that Adamic kind of creation. She's still living according to the old order of things, my God. She's still living in Adam. But Jesus shows up. He's the seventh man that she encounters. Because what Jesus is bringing for this woman is something called rest. And this is why on the seventh day, God rested from his work. See, and those of us who enter into Christ, we rest from our labor. Why? Because we've entered into the new covenant. We've entered into the rest of God because the rest of God can only come as we draw out of those living waters. It's completion. Glory to God. Glory to God. I hope you're hearing this. I, ho I hope your spirit is open. <laughs> now, let's keep going. So the woman said, the woman says, sir, I perceive you're a prophet. Now, now, now let me talk about this thing about prophets for a minute. 
Jesus did not say to the woman, listen, I'm a prophet, so I'm going to tell you something about yourself so you'll know I'm a prophet. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus functioned prophetically, which caused the woman to identify he was a prophet, which indicates this woman understood prophets. Oh, my. This woman understood prophets. Why? Because Samaria had prophets. They were just false prophets, but they were prophets. This is that whole Jezbalian system. Remember where the Samaritans came from. <laughs> this is what I'm trying to say, folks. Listen, listen, listen. Mm, 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 mm. True prophecy, true prophecy will unpack. Hear me. True prophets and true prophecy will peel back the layers of your deepest longing to give you an answer. Stay with me now. True prophets and true prophecy will peel back the deepest longings of your life to give you an answer. True prophets and prophecy is not about coming to tell you everything you're doing wrong. Hear me. Hear me. Hear me. <laughs> Hear me. And yet yeah, we would say, we would say he gave her a word of wisdom. Now watch this. Now watch this. Watch this now. Don't take it the wrong way. Because this is what we've actually done to the ministry of the Spirit. This is what we've done. We, we, we have taken the manifestations of the Spirit and we try to divide them into these nice, clean, cut categories. Well, this is a word of wisdom and this is a what No, what Jesus did... Jesus just allowed the Spirit of God to flow out of him. Then we try, to, and then we will categorize it because that's how we think, right? It was a word of knowledge, though. It was. It was. It was a word of knowledge. It really was. But that's what, when we read the story, that's typically what we're trying to find. Well, was this a word of wisdom or was this a word of knowledge or was this this? What the woman said is, I perceive you're a prophet. Okay, that's what she saw. Why did she perceive he was a prophet? Because he was able to peel back the deepest recesses, my God, of her heart. The deepest longings of her heart. Watch. We don't need to be so concerned about whether or not we can give a word of wisdom and a word of knowledge. What we need to be concerned about is whether or not we're in a position where the Spirit of God can flow freely through us at any given moment of time to meet the need of the individual. That's really what the gifts, quote unquote, of the Spirit are all about. The Spirit of God, mm, mm, mm. who, Lord Jesus, the Spirit of God distributes these gifts severally as he will. So it's really not even necessary for us to understand, well, what's the word of wisdom? What's the word of knowledge? What's it is? What's it that? No, we just need to be able to allow the living water of the spirit to flow out of us at any given time. And the spirit of God will manifest himself and release a gift of whatever that particular person needs. But we're running around, not y'all, but we're running around trying to teach everybody how to operate in spiritual gifts. We've missed the point. We've missed the boat. And this is why people's needs really aren't being met because we're shotgunning the gifts. We throw stuff out and whatever sticks, that's, that's what they got. 
Let me keep going. Let me keep going. Y'all getting anything out of this? I am. So the woman said, the woman said, I perceive that you are a prophet. Now we're going to get to the real issue. Here we go. Our fathers worshipped. What is Jesus driving for? Why did Jesus need to go through Samaria? What was the point of Jesus engaging this woman at the well? What is Jesus trying to bring to the Samaritans? Stay with me. Stay with me. He didn't bring up her husband to convict her of adultery. There's something deeper Jesus is reaching for. So Jesus said unto her, woman, mm, mm, mm. she says, our fathers worshiped in this mountain and you Jews say, Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Listen, this issue that Jesus is dealing with this thing is a couple hundred years old. This is going back to 1 Kings chapters 12 through 16. The issue is worship. Jeroboam said, I'm going to set up this system of worship for Israel because if they go back to Jerusalem, their heart is going to return to Rehoboam. Jesus is coming to deal with this issue that has been standing for hundreds of years and people were trapped in a system that it wasn't their fault they were trapped in it this is what they've been taught for hundreds of years i wonder how many people tonight are trapped in a religious system that's a couple hundred years old that has nothing to do with the true worship of god it's the tradition of men. Now, it can hype you up. I'm, I'm going to be honest. It can hype you up. It can make you feel better on Sunday. Then when you wake up on Monday, you find out your problems are all still there. <laughs> Let me say it again. It'll hype you up on Sunday... And for some people, for some people, it don't even take to Monday. To, for some people, it sets in about two hours after they leave the church. When they come down off that spiritual high, they realize ain't nothing changed. Ain't nothing changed. It'll hype you up. <laughs> then people come along and tell you, well, the real problem is you've got a generational curse. So they start making up doctrines to explain why you're not getting free sitting in their ministry. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yes. Let me say it again. They make up doctrines to explain to you why you're not getting free eating, as my sister says. No, the reason you can't get free is because you're sitting there eating that Gerber gospel. <laughs> and I quote... Minister Cha, eating that Gerber gospel that's keeping you a tabernacle toddler so you never grow in your knowledge and understanding of the word of God. Are you listening to me? And this is why they don't want you to feed on the word of God. Absolutely. Absolutely, Pastor Don. Absolutely. That's why they don't want to feed you the word of God. You know, and I hear people say all the time, especially in our, in, in our Sunday night class, they say, well, how come the churches aren't teaching us this? And I say one of two reasons. Number one, they don't want you to know. Number two, which is probably more to the point, they don't know. See, we can't teach what we don't know. So many times I say, if, if ministry is not teaching this freedom of the word of God, it's because they don't know. They can only teach what they know. They're doing the best they can. Seriously, they're doing the best they can. And I'm not, I'm not judging them. I'm not critiquing them. I'm not criticizing them. I believe they're sincere. I believe that their heart is pure. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. 
What I am saying is we need to understand that we are in a process of restoration. God is restoring truth to the body today. He's restoring his truth. But we have to be willing to allow God's truth to deconstruct our traditions. Listen, it hap- listen, folk, nobody is exempt from this process. I shared a little bit on the front end of this how God is dealing with me on some things. He says, son, you're real good at trying to encourage people to deal with their tradition. So let me unpack a lot of yours for you so I can see how you allow the Spirit of God to deal with your tradition. But I can tell you this, if you allow the Spirit of God to deal with your tradition, you are probably unstopping the well that the enemy has stopped up. You are probably going to find yourself allowing the Spirit of God to remove the debris and to remove the rubbish from out of your spirit so the rivers of living water can flow out. I don't think you hear me. (laughs) Really, I don't. I don't think you hear me. Your problem is not a devil. Your problem is probably bad teaching. I got my cup. Don't get mad. Get free. Your problem is probably not a devil. Your problem is probably bad teaching. So the issue is worship. Now watch. So Jesus said unto her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you are neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem going to worship the Father. Right? You are neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem are you going to worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship because salvation is of the Jews. That's a strong statement for Jesus to make. He wasn't being very politically correct. She probably thought he was a little arrogant and bold when he made the statement. See, when you, when you start talking truth, When you begin to just simply speak the truth, people will misread you. People will call you arrogant. People will call you prideful. Now, they don't know you. (laughs) Y'all hear what I'm saying? They don't know you. They've never had a conversation with you. But they will say you're arrogant. You're full of pride. You're a know-it-all. You know, they throw all of this stuff out. Because you're simply speaking truth. Y'all correct me if I'm wrong. I've never seen Jesus to send anyone to preach his word or to teach his word that he didn't teach first. So when we go, we should not be teaching opinion. (laughs) Does this make sense? If you don't believe what you're teaching, why are you teaching it? What is it, up for debate? Is truth now up for debate? I'm just asking a question. Is truth up for debate? (coughs) Or have you brought into this, well, everybody's truth isn't the same. That's a lie straight out of the pit of hell. Everybody's truth isn't the same. So you can have your truth and I got my truth. Do I look like I'm a Buddhist to you? Do I sound like I'm teaching, you know, Eastern mysticism or Confucianism? You know, your truth is your truth and this person, their truth is their truth and the other person's truth is their truth. No, that's that postmodern lie that has been, you know, hoisted upon the church and passed through a lot of these liberal schools of theology. That's what that is. That's what that is. Truth is truth. God's word is truth. The spirit of God is the spirit of truth. Do I know everything? Absolutely not. 
neither do you. But we have to be willing to allow the Spirit of God to daily, and I do mean daily, correct our misunderstandings so that we could get rooted and grounded and established in the truth. Uh huh. Ephesians 4 says what? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. For what? For the perfecting of the saints. So they can do the work of the ministry, which is, results in the edifying of the body of Christ until we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ that we be no more henceforth children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men whereby they lie in wait in craftiness to deceive, but we can speak the truth in love. We can grow up into him. Are you with me? Are you with me? <laughs> I ain't talking about getting blown away with every little wind of doctrine that floats out here. This is not the, this is not the time for that to be taking place among those of us who claim that we've been sent with the word of the Lord. Okay, let me keep going here. That was for somebody. So Jesus said, woman, believe me, woman, believe me, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers are going to worship the father in spirit and in truth, right? You worship, you know, not what you he, he's saying to the woman. And by extension, he's saying to some of us, y'all are going through all of this stuff, calling it worship. And you don't even know what you're worshiping. Your worship is like in vain. Jesus said at one point to the Jews, he said, you know, you, you know, you worship, your worship is in vain because you're teaching for, you're teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men. You're teaching for doctrine, the traditions of men. Your worship is in vain. He says to the woman, you worship, you know not what. And some people are sitting up in churches they don't know what they worshiping. Why? They don't know what they believe. What do you believe about God? And why do you believe it? What do you believe about Jesus? And why do you believe it? What do you believe about the Holy Spirit? And why do you believe it? Everybody's talking about flowing in the Holy Ghost. Let's talk about the Holy Ghost. What do you believe about the Holy Ghost? Does this make sense? And, and But people just sit there and they get caught up in the moment and they're going through all of these antics and they walk out and they don't know any more than they knew when they went in there, intellectually or spiritually. See, God gave us a brain. He expects us to use it. He gave us a spirit. He expects us to develop it. Does this make sense? But if you're not learning anything here and you're not receiving anything in your spirit, what are you worshiping? What's the point? What, what's the point of going? <laughs> oh. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. So, woman, you worship, you know not what. Verse 22. We know what we worship. Salvations of the Jews. Verse 23. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit. Watch. And in truth. Jesus said in John chapter 17, Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And how are the true worshipers going to worship? They're going to worship the Father in spirit and in truth. In spirit and in truth. Now, here's an interesting dynamic, because you can't know the truth of the word unless the spirit of God reveals the truth of the word. So we need the spirit of God to unveil the word of God so we understand the truth that's in the word. But here's the but here's the problem. Here's the flip side. <laughs> the truth of the word will always point back to Jesus, who the spirit of God comes to glorify you see how this works so you can't just have the spirit of god just showing you a bunch of stuff no the spirit of god is going to point you to the word of god which is going to reveal 
Jesus, who's the Word made flesh. So you've got to use the Spirit to understand the Word, but and you have to have the Word to discern whether or not the Spirit you think you're encountering is actually the Spirit of Christ. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It's not either or, it's both and. You need the spirit to unveil the word, but you have to have the word to know what spirit you're listening to. Because every spirit speaking is not the Holy Spirit. That's why they don't talk about Jesus. All right, now let me keep going. I'm almost closed. Verse 24, God is a spirit. <laughs> Can you say God is a spirit? God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So Jesus had to fundamentally come and reintroduce to the woman at Samaria, and then she would go back and tell the city, come see a man that told me everything that I ever did. And when they came out, when they heard Jesus, then they understood this is the Messiah that was to come. Jesus used the woman and ministering to the woman to reach the city. Prophets and true prophecy has the aim of reaching a city. If, if you just get in a word of prophecy or a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom to make your life better, folk, we've missed the point. <laughs> we really missed the point of the ministry of the Spirit. See, the, oh my goodness. The Spirit of God ministers all of that and displays all of that because he's trying to reach people groups. Are you listening? He's not trying to make us and help us live the American dream. Are you with me? He's trying to reach people groups, not help us live the American dream because we don't have a seat at the table. All right, let me keep going. So what did Jesus say? God is a spirit. He had to reintroduce God to this woman. She was worshiping stuff. She didn't even know what she was worshiping. The Samaritans had no idea what they were worshiping. Many churches today have no idea what they're worshiping. They don't. They really don't. Just go visit. <laughs> they don't. They, they really don't. You know, they worship in mama's God. They worship in grandmama's God. They worship in Uncle Bobby's God. They worship in the God that you know, spoke to the elders back in the 19, you know, they, 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 you know, they just repeating this stuff over and over and over and over and over and over. And people are not receiving the living water. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now let's, let's talk a little bit more about this living water. I'm just about done. Watch this. Let's go to John chapter 7, I believe it is. Let me check. This is good. I'm almost done. Y'all going to like this, though. You're going to be glad you stayed. John chapter 7. Let's look at verse 37. Watch this. John chapter 7. Third party worship. <laughs> I like that. Well, y'all come up with some stuff. Now, now, and, and let me say, all of this stuff that y'all come up with, y'all know you will hear it from, you will hear it again from me. But I'm going to give you credit for it because I'm going to keep that one. Folk got third party worship. <laughs> I quote Pastor Dawn on that one. Now watch, John chapter 7, verse 37. Watch this. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, watch this, if any man thirst, and he's going back to this thirst, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scriptures has said, uh-oh, 
he that believes on me as the scriptures have said. It's not he that believes on me as their pastor said, as their denomination said, as their creed says. He that believes on me as the scriptures has said. See, we've got to know what the scriptures have to say about Jesus. We've got to know what the scripture has to say about God. We've got to know what the scripture has to say about redemption. We've got to know what the scriptures say about the work of the Holy Ghost. He that believes on me as the scripture has said. Cause we got a lot of folks say they believe on Jesus, but it ain't like the scriptures have said. <laughs> they got another Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> they got another Jesus. They got another gospel and they following another spirit. He that believes on me as the scriptures have said. Mm. Now, let me point this out. And I pointed this out before. You do understand when Jesus made that statement, the only scriptures that they had were the Old Testament. So when he said he that believes on me as the scriptures have said, he's referring to the Old Testament. Which is why he tried to tell the Jews, he says, listen, if you had a believed Moses, you would believe me because Moses wrote about me. See, the God that we're talking about that was manifested in Jesus is none other than the great I am. He is the El Shaddai. He is the Almighty One. He is the God that brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and led him through the wilderness. It's not a different God that was manifested in Christ. Jesus is not a junior God. <laughs> He's not a junior God. He is God manifested in the flesh. He is the son of the living God. Really? Yeah. Come here, Mary. Mary. Oh my, Mary, 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 you're going to conceive in your womb and that holy thing that shall be born of you shall be called the son of God. How's this going to happen? Because the spirit of the Lord is going to come upon you and the power of the highest is going to overshadow you. And that holy thing that is born in you shall be called the son of God. God was his father. Oh, my God. See? Now, the, now, theologians want to argue about it. You see? Let me help you. Theologians want to argue about it. Religious people want to dispute about it. You know why? Because Jesus said, no man knows who the Son is except the one that the Father chooses to reveal him. And no man knows who the Father is except the Son and whomsoever the Son chooses to reveal him. The only way you can know the real revelation of Christ, you've got to get it by revelation. And the only one that can reveal it is the spirit of God. Why? Because God is a spirit. Y'all help me. Y'all stay with me now. Somebody going to get free. Y'all stay with me. See, I done brushed up against somebody's tradition. They, they got to go. <laughs> well... Well, he just said, yeah, that's, no, I didn't say it. The scripture said it. He that believes on me as the scripture has said. See? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now watch. He that believes on me as the scripture has said. Uh-huh. As the scripture has said. If any man thirsts. Out of his belly. Now, doesn't this sound like the same thing he told the woman? He said, he that believes on me as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Isn't that what Jesus said? Mm-hmm. He told the Jews the same thing. Now he's talking to the Pharisees. He told the woman at the well, if you drink of the water that I give you, the water that I will give you will be in you a well of water springing up into everlasting life. This is what he told the woman at the well. He gives the Jews the same message in a different way. He says, he that believes on me as the scripture has said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. Verse 39. But this spake he of the spirit. 
Uh oh. Which they that believe on him should receive because the Holy Spirit has not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. The living water that Jesus was referencing was the Spirit. It's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you knew the gift of God, now, now, now I'm going to tie this together. If you knew the gift of God and who it was that was saying unto you, my God, give me something to drink, you would ask of him and he would give you living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, in which those that believe on him were to receive. What is the gift of God? The gift of God is the spirit. Somebody said, that's not true. Stay with me. I got to <laughs> stay with me. Stay with me. Stay with me. Let me read this verse out of Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 2. Let's look and see. Let's see what the problem was. Jeremiah chapter 2. My, 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 my. Verse 13. Ah, that's the gift of God. Now, I'm going to show it to you in a minute. I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to show it to you. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. Glory be to God forevermore. There's no other name given among heaven whereby we must be saved other than the name of Jesus. Jeremiah chapter 2. I'm going to start at verse 12. Be astonished, O you heaven. Now, let me back up. Jeremiah chapter 2, let's start at verse 11. Has a nation changed their gods? This is the prophet Jeremiah. <laughs> for, those who, for those of you who like Jeremiah. Jeremiah said, has a nation changed their gods, which are not gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Uh-huh. This is what God is asking. Excuse me. This is what God is asking Jeremiah. Jeremiah, <laughs> has a nation changed their God? This is God asking Jeremiah. This is not Jeremiah asking the question. This is God asking Jeremiah. Has a nation changed their gods? Which are not gods? You mean to tell me that my people, my nation, my children, oh, read Jeremiah. Those that I brought up out of Israel, you mean to tell me that those that I led through the desert, those that I redeemed with my own outstretched hand, those who I have watched over, those that I've nourished, those that I have given nations to, do you mean to tell me they done switched their teams? They done, thank you, thank you, Minister Chop. They've gone from the big G to the little G? Do you mean to tell me? <laughs> Has a nation changed their gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit? What was the problem with Israel? They went into idolatry. They started worshiping all these other gods. They, they start taking the practices of the nations round about them and tried to bring them into Israel. And they corrupted the faith of Israel, just like the church today has been corrupted. We got all this stuff in the church. I'm talking about teachings that have nothing to do with the gospel. And then folk get mad when you point it out. And then they want to call you a Pharisee or they want to call you religious because you want to go by the book. I want to know what the scripture says. That's what I want to know. I want to know what the apostles preach. If the apostles didn't preach it, if the apostles didn't teach it, <laughs> I don't have no use for it. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Give me Bible. Now watch. Be astonished, O you heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be, be very desolate, saith the Lord. Verse 13. Now, y'all stay with me. Y'all stay with me. Verse 13. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. For my people, this is what God says to Jeremiah. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me. The fountain of living waters. Sound familiar? <laughs> and they have hewn themselves out cisterns, 
broken cisterns that can hold no water. Here was Israel's problem. They had forsaken God, the source of living water. And they've made these cisterns, broken cisterns, that could hold no water. In other words, these systems, these gods that they're worshiping, these practices that they're engaged in, can hold no water. They're broken. You pour into them and it pours right out of them. It's like being a pastor in the church and every week you pouring in the people <laughs> to talk to them 10 minutes later and they didn't retain nothing that you said. My, 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 my. God said they've, 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 they've committed two. The first one is they've forsaken me. I am the fountain of of living water living water comes from me i am the source of the living water are y'all with me i'm the source this is what god says to jeremiah jesus said god is a spirit then he says they that believe on me as the scripture has says out of their belly will flow rivers of living water but this spake he of the spirit God is a spirit. I keep trying to tell people, everybody running around talking about what the Holy Spirit told them. They fail to remember that the Holy Spirit is God. God is holy. God is a spirit. The Holy Spirit is God. He is the fountain of living water. Oh, I hope y'all hear me. I hope you hear me. I hope you hear me. One more little passage. <laughs> Glory to God. Somebody's getting free tonight. I know this is I, I, I know this is rubbing up against some folks' belief. I know this is rubbing up against some stuff that we that, that we've been taught all our life. Folk, there's some stuff I believed for 35 or 40 years that I'm just now starting to understand. I had it wrong. Are you listening to me? And I've, I've been involved in ministry. I'm not talking about stuff that's going to send folk to hell. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about some fundamental basic understanding about the nature of God. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit. Spirit and in truth, God is the source of the living water. And when Jesus talked about the living water, he was talking about the Spirit. The gift of God is the Holy Spirit. That is the promise of the Father. Somebody said, I don't believe it. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. <laughs> don't get nervous. Don't get nervous. Peter's preaching, verse 38. What does he say? Peter said unto them, Peter said, glory to God, glory to God. Yeah, yeah, they missed your teaching, then they want to remix. I tell them, go read your Bible. <laughs> go listen to the replay. <laughs> but watch, but watch this, <coughs> watch this. Peter said, and this is where folk get nervous, but watch this. Peter said, after Peter preached this message, Peter said, look, this Jesus has God raised up. Hear me. This Jesus, verse 32, this Jesus, this, this one, this one, this one, this Jesus has God raised up whereof we are witnesses. This is the apostolic witness. Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this, which you now see and hear. That's why Jesus said, it's expedient for you that I go away. If I don't go, the comforter will not come. But if I go, I'll send him. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come back to you. Now the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. The promise that was given to Israel about the redemptive work of the Father was the promise of the Spirit. <laughs> it's the promise of the Spirit. What Spirit? The Holy Spirit. What Spirit? God the Spirit. 
one spirit, the spirit of prophecy, one spirit, the spirit of grace, one spirit, the spirit of holiness. It's all the same spirit. Those are different characteristics and attributes of his ministry. My, 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 my. And so what does Peter say? What does Peter say? Don't get nervous and don't get mad. I'm reading what Peter said. Here it goes. He said, David didn't ascend into heaven, but he says to himself, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes your footstool. So let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made that same Jesus who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. God has made that same Jesus, both Lord and Christ. He made who? That same Jesus. So why do people have a problem with the name of Jesus? Inquiring minds want to know. What's the problem with people and the name of Jesus? Because the apostle said, whatsoever you do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord. What is the Lord's name? The Lord's name is Jesus. But why do people have a problem with the name of Jesus? Now watch. Now when they heard this, <laughs> they were pricked in their heart. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles. They said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles. Now, do you think that Peter and the rest of the apostles knew what they were talking about? Do you think that Peter and the rest of the apostles understood what Jesus said? Now, I'm going to read something, and I know what's going to happen. Automatically, people are going to run. They're going to go ask their pastor about what I just said. And then their pastor is going to misinterpret what the scriptures clearly say. Because that's, that's just how we are. <laughs> Now, should you check stuff with your pastor? Absolutely. You should check everything with your pastor, including what your pastor teach. <laughs> you need to have your pastor back up what they're saying the word of God says. And if you have question about what someone else is teaching, you should be able to take it to your pastor. But let me help you, because if your pastor contradicts what the scriptures say, you better go with what the scriptures say, despite what your pastor say. I'm just saying. Now watch. Mm. Is it just me or is the Holy Spirit digging tonight? <laughs> Verse 38. Peter and the rest of the apostles. So I'm pretty sure that whatever Peter and the rest of the apostles did in the book of Acts is the way it should be done. I'm pretty, I'm pretty convinced of that. Verse 38. Peter said unto them, uh-oh, <laughs> repent. That's step number one. <laughs> Can you say repent? Somebody say repent. If you understand what I mean by repent, put up a one. <laughs> oh, if you understand what I mean when, you, when, when the books say repent, that means now that you've been convicted by the Holy Spirit. Because remember, it says they were pricked in their heart. See, that's the Holy Spirit pricking the heart. That's the Holy Spirit bringing conviction regarding the Lordship of Christ. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repent. We can't even repent unless the Spirit of God draws us to repentance. It's a work of the Spirit. It's a work of the Spirit. See, it's a work, it's a work of the Spirit. Pastor Dawn said she was getting some ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> well, what you eating, Rocky Road? Did you get some Rocky Road? But watch this. Peter said, number one, repent. And <laughs> this is where people get nervous. Oh, butter pecan. That's my wife's favorite. 
My wife loves some butter pecan. I don't like it. I like cookies and cream. But watch. He says, repent. Now, this is where people get nervous. And be baptized. Now, watch. Every one of you in the name uh -oh, of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sin. What is the name given whereby we must be saved? Uh-oh. What is the name? He just got finished saying, God has made this same Jesus both Lord and Christ. Now, what you need to do is you need to repent and be baptized in the name of of the Lord Jesus. You need to identify with the work of the Lord Jesus. This is not a baptismal formula. And this is what I'm saying. We get so we we, we so formulaic. We so formulaic. <laughs> we so formulaic. <laughs> you need to repent and you need to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And literally it's being immersed into the name of the Lord Jesus in the same way 1 Corinthians chapter 10 talks about how the children of Israel were baptized in, unto Moses in the sea see that's a type and shadow they were baptized with Moses so they were identified with the work of Moses through baptism and when we are baptized into the name of the Lord, we are identified with the work of the Lord Jesus. So Paul could say, don't you know so many of us as were baptized, were baptized into his death, therefore being buried with him by baptism. We are also risen with him through faith in the operation of God. This is what our baptism is about. And what did Peter say? He said, you need to repent and you need to be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. The only way sin can be remitted is we have to identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. That's what remits sin. It's the power of his blood. But you have to identify with him to receive the uh, application of his blood for the remission of our sin. That's Bible. We need to come on back to Bible. That's Bible. I'm not talking about a formula. I'm talking about a reality. And so what happens after you repent and are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin? And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you knew the gift of God, do you see what Jesus is driving at with the woman? Huh? You see what Jesus is driving at? If you, if, if you want this living water, you have to repent. You've got to turn from worshiping what you don't know. You have to turn to Jesus, who God has made both Lord and Christ. You have to identify with him. You see, receive forgiveness of sin and you will receive the gift of of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39, for the promise is unto you. The promise has always been the forgiveness of sin and renewal of the Holy Ghost. The living water that the Father wants to give us can only be found in the gift of the Holy Ghost. But the only way to get the gift of the Holy Ghost is number one, you have to repent. Number two, you have to identify with the Lord Jesus. Then you'll receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. My God. That's the simplicity, folk. <laughs> that is literally the simplicity. But people want to short, people want to short circuit the process. They don't want to repent, but they want the Holy Ghost. They don't want to be baptized, but they want the Holy Ghost. Then some people want the Holy Ghost, 
but they don't want the evidence of the Holy Ghost. Because when they were baptized in the Holy Ghost, the scripture says they were all filled with the Spirit and they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What was this, what was this gift? That gift of the Holy Ghost, that speaking in tongues served as the tap in their spirit that loosed the living water to flow. Oh my gosh. That's what tongues is all about. Tongues is not about yabba dabba do hook em a shy. Let me show you how I tie my bow tie. That's not what tongues is all about. Tongues is the tap that gets turned to loose the living water to flow out of you. Jesus said, he that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly is going to flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believed on him were to receive because the Holy Ghost was not yet given. And when the spirit was poured out and they were filled with the spirit, what happened? They began to speak with other tongues. Where was it coming from? It was coming out of their belly. They had living water that began to flow out of them and it flowed out into the earth. And what was the result of the first flow of the spirit? 3,000 people got saved y'all ain't listening y'all ain't listening from that initial flow of the spirit out of the disciples on the day of pentecost three thousand got saved why because they did it the way jesus said to do it we don't want to do it his way we want to keep worshiping we know not what. We want to stay up in Samaria. <laughs> we want to go glory my basata. We want to stay up in Samaria worshiping we know not what. And all of the while, Jesus is saying, I've got some living water. I want you to be filled with my spirit. I want to fill you with my presence. I want the same spirit that was in me to be on you. I want you walking in my spirit because that's the only way you can worship the Father in spirit and in truth you must be born again you must repent you must identify with Jesus you must be filled with the Holy Ghost it's not an option it's not an option beloved it's the gift of the Father the promise is unto you and to as many as the Lord our God shall call. And when you receive the Spirit of God, your life is fundamentally changed. I'm just here to tell you. It's changed. And, then, and, 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 and it doesn't then become a lifestyle of trying to fight demons and devils. This is the thing. This is the thing that confuses me. When I hear all of these people that's supposed to be so full of the spirit and so anointing of the spirit, and the only thing that they talk about is fighting demons and devils, chasing demons and devils. We should be talking about the love of God. We we should be learning about worshiping God. We should be lifting up the name of Jesus because what the Holy Spirit does when he comes is he glorifies and he magnifies the name of the Lord Jesus. There is no other name, beloved, given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved it's the name of Jesus but the enemy has caused the church to back up off the name of Jesus I'm just here to tell you I'm going to do a real good teaching on this one night because I just need to do it this is, why problem, this is the reason people have a problem with the baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Although there's a bunch of people who are out talking about it and they've kind of twisted some things about it, right? They've really twisted some things about this baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus, right? And they've, they've added some dynamics that the apostles didn't put on it. Um, but there's no other name given among men whereby we're supposed to be saved. 
The only name that they baptized in was the name of Jesus. And then people say, oh, well, baptism doesn't save. No, Jesus saves. <laughs> Jesus saves. That's who saves. Jesus saves. Let me, let me, let me say it again. Jesus saved. Jesus saves because Jesus is Lord and Jesus is Christ. Now, because he's Lord, he expects us to obey his commandments. And that's one of his commandments. That's why he told the disciples, go into all of the world, preach the gospel, right? Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Do you notice it doesn't say baptizing them in the names, plural? Baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> There's only one name. That name is Jesus. That's what he told the disciples that's what he told Peter and the rest of the apostles in the book of Matthew, right? That's what he told them. But when, but when they went to do it, what did they do? They baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus because they understood who Jesus was. They understood who he was. We are the ones who can't distinguish Jesus from Santa Claus. We are the ones who can't distinguish the resurrection of Christ from an Easter bunny. We are the ones that got that problem. They didn't have it. That's why they could preach and cities would get turned upside down. Are you listening? Don't get mad. Get free. Don't get mad. Don't get mad. We, everybody praying. Everybody been praying for a move of God. God is moving by his spirit. And one of the things he is restoring is a proper understanding and a proper revelation of why the name of Jesus is so powerful. It's not a formula. <laughs> it's not a formula. Everything God is, is in his son, Jesus. And then he said, they that believe in my name. Folk don't have no faith in the name because they don't have no faith in him. Because they worship and they know not what. Uh-huh. They worship in what they, they, they know not what. But I submit to you tonight, I'm closing. If you will receive this word, if you will receive this word, not because I said it. If you will receive this word in the sense that you say, I'm going to be like the Bereans and I'm going to go and I'm going to check this out. I'm going to go back and I'm going to go through my scripture to see if those things are so. I'm talking about receiving the word in that sense. If you will receive this word and you will go and you study it out and you pray it out and you ask the spirit of God to open the eyes of your understanding, I'm telling you, your life will not be the same. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, your life will not be the same. Those of you who have been struggling to get filled with the Holy Ghost, your life will not be the same. It won't. It won't. One of the reasons, one of the reasons some of you all struggle with the whole thing about being filled with the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues, you got a lot of bad teaching about it. That's that's what the problem is. You've got a lot you've got a lot of bad teaching about what it means to be filled with the spirit and 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 the whole idea about tongues. One of the re <laughs> Do I want to say this? Yeah. Cuz I had the same problem. I had the same problem, so I had the same problem, so I'm not criticizing you. One of the reasons some people, some of you all, don't have an effective prayer life because you get confused when you go to pray because you ain't sure, am I supposed to be praying to the Father? Am I supposed to be praying to Jesus? Am I, am I supposed to be praying to the Holy Ghost? Who am I supposed to be praying to? <laughs> I had that problem too. And God is helping me to process that, see? God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses. He's given us the ministry of reconciliation. And when I receive the spirit of, of, of when I receive the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of Christ. So who do I pray to? <laughs> I pray to the Father. Understanding it was the Father manifested in the Son. And understanding it's the Father manifested as the Holy Spirit. 
but I pray to the Father. And that's why Jesus set the pattern. He said, when you pray, pray. When you pray, say our Father. Jesus is giving us a model of how we humans, children, born again, ought to respond to God, the Father, who is spirit. Jesus modeled all of this. He's the pattern son. That's why he's the son of God. Jesus is always referred to as the son of God. Am I right about it? <laughs> if I'm not, y'all help me out. If I'm not, y'all help me out. But...